But I'd like to welcome everybody um, on behalf of uh, South Yorkshire Biodiversity Research Group to the workshop this afternoon. We are going to be recording the proceedings so that we can post a video up, um, of the workshop to our YouTube channel uh, at a later date. So if you don't want to appear on the recording, then please turn off your, uh, your video now. We'll also be taking questions um, via chat and inviting people to ask those in person. Or if you don't want to actually appear, then we can read these out on, on your behalf. Um, so I'll just give you a little, right, okay. So we could, we're now starting to record the, uh, record the proceedings. South Yorkshire Biodiversity Research Group, or SYBRG for short, have been organising events, conferences, workshops and community projects for um, around 30 years or so uh, now, which is a, a scary amount of time in some ways, on a variety of subjects, but with few key themes. One of our strong themes running from the earliest days, right back into the uh, 1990s, is uh, woodland history, archaeology and heritage, particularly around ancient woodlands, uh, wood pasture and shadow woods. And another of our main themes is our, around landscape change and cultural severance, um, with impacts on peatlands, wetlands, farming practices and rural industries. However, over the last seven or eight years or so, we've been developing our wild visions, reconstructing nature for the 21st century programme with a series of conferences and events. Our focus is on wilder, more connected future scapes, halting the decline of species and environmental quality, yet recognising the cultural nature and heritage value of the landscape that we inhabit and rely on um, for mm. our existence. Uh, the idea for the Wilder Ancombe project arose out of these, some of these discussions at some of the um, uh, events. And so later in the year, we're actually going to be holding two, uh, two conferences on the rewilding theme. Uh, we weren't able to hold our conference last year, so we've now split it into two. The first in May focuses on mind and body with new deficits and, um, and reconnections. And the second in September is around renewing the land and renaturing the soil, which may also be of interest to people um, today. However, today, this afternoon, we're focusing on farmland birds through our Wilder Ancombe project. So I'll hand over to Lewis to complete the introductions and uh, start the ball rolling. Thank you. So, over to you, Lewis. So uh, yeah, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, as Christy mentioned, we run nature and heritage projects and this specific project is a heritage lottery funded project called Rediscovering and Rewilding a Lost Landscape, Lincolnshire's Ancombe Valley. Um, so Jenny and I are project officers on, on this project and we're working towards making the Ancombe more friendly for wildlife, better for biodiversity and also helping people explore the local heritage and nature that's on their doorstep. So far, we've led a series of successful events, uh, including a GPS and digital mapping day, some bird and photography walks, and a really successful day in Winteringham, exploring how to make the village's green spaces a little bit more wildlife friendly. Now, COVID-19 has forced us all to adapt, and some of our more recent events have been taken virtually, like this one, uh, and along with a virtual fungi foray, which we filmed with a local mycologist and is live on our YouTube channel. Uh, looking forward to the future in the summer, uh, we've got a series of events planned, including spring and summer wildlife surveys with the community, some woodland walks, some heritage events, including exploring the duck decoys uh, that are local to the Ancombe Valley, um, and a really exciting backyard archaeological dig with a local archaeologist, um, where we're going to encourage people to dig test pits in their back gardens and, um, and then identify what, what artefacts we can find. <clears throat> Uh, these will be live in-person events if we can, if restrictions allow, um, but if not, we'll be doing them virtually. So if these are of interest to you, keep in touch with our Facebook page and we'll be uh, posting about all the events coming up on there. So reining it back into farm and birds, uh, as the name suggests, is a group of birds that require farming to live, eat and reproduce. And these include species like lapwing, yellowhammer, reed bunting, grey partridge, 
and also owls, uh, such as tawny owl, barn owl, or little owl. And the modern farming techniques, not to go in this, into it too much, have made it somewhat more difficult for these species to thrive. So today's webinar is exploring some small changes that you can make on farmland that can make a big difference. So with us today, we have Jim Lennon, who is a former RSPB conservation advisor and a current British Trust for Ornithology bird ringer. Uh, he'll, he's led our virtual farm and walk, which we'll be watching in just a few minutes, and is um, yeah, very good on, on all things farm and birds and owls. And we also have Kirsty Brennan from Oak Bank Game and Conservation, who is going to be giving a talk on the agri-environment schemes that uh, landowners can get involved with uh, to help boost biodiversity. So a bit of housekeeping, uh, just to get things to run as smoothly as possible. If people keep their microphones on mute at all times, unless asked not to. Um, and any questions, if they can come through on the chat function, which is a little speech bubble at the bottom of the screen. If you can send questions through on there, and then when, when we get to our Q&A, you'll be asked to, to speak your question. Um, so other than that, unless anyone has any questions, we'll roll straight into the farm and bird walk. changing nature of the human race's existence results in a planet that is rarely consistent as the years go by. For wildlife, adaptation is a slow and steady process, and as the world is modified by humans, wildlife struggles to keep up, leading to the declines witnessed in biodiversity. Farmland birds are no exception. Since the 1970s, as farming practices change, farmland bird species have declined by 48%. Changes such as loss of mixed farming, increased pesticide use, increased field size, field drainage and other factors such as climate change have all contributed, but farmers are most certainly not to blame. In fact, farming plays a vital role in conservation. What's important is that farming and bird life can and do it coexist. In this video, Jim Lennon, a British Trust for Ornithology bird ringer, and former RSPB conservation advisor will discuss the big three concept and how that can be applied across farmland to boost survival and reproduction rates of farmland birds. My name's Jim Lennon and I'm passionate about farmland birds and owls. I, I think arable farming sometimes gets a bad deal from the media. There's actually lots of wildlife here on on arable farmland, but there's also lots that you can do to help birds on arable farmland. And hopefully you get some hints and tips in the following talk about how to help them farm the birds, and um, particularly barn owls on your farm as well. My, my interest start, uh, stems from working part-time for the RSPB, talking to farmers about their birds on the Isle of Axon. I'm also a licensed bird ringer since the 1990s, and one of my big interests is with barn owls and I monitor barn owls in South Northamptonshire and Northamptonshire. Working with farm and birds, you, you, soon, uh, you soon learn it's, they're, they're quite simple to help in, in a lot of ways. You've got to think about the big, big three, and, and that splits into uh, three issues. Uh, where, where they uh, feed in the summer, and what food they have for themselves and their chicks. Where they feed in the winter, where are those overwinter supplies of food, especially when uh, food for species like finches and buntings runs out in the late winter, and also um, that the right habitat for them to breed. And we'll talk about uh, field margins, boundaries, dikes and ditches, where which helps a lot of birds. Here you can see a quite young hedge, perhaps, I don't know, 15, 20 years old, you can still see guards on the base of the hedge. Um, this hedge has grown up and then been machine cut every year, probably. And what you end up with is a, almost like lollipops, with a, a very open base. And a, a base of the hedge is where 
Um, most of the benefits are for farmer birds where in these edges here when they're grown up is where you find yellow hammers and grey partridge breeding. Perhaps this hedge would be better to be laid or which is expensive or to possibly cut it off um, about a foot off the ground or th you know three five hundred mil to create a coppice effect then you'll get growth coming from the stumps which will create a, ultimately a thicker hedge. It's something you could do in rotation by doing alternate strips. Okay, well water courses are a uh, great, great place for wildlife in um, um, large arable landscapes um, but they need to be managed um, for wildlife and this is a good example here where one left hand bank has been trimmed possibly in the last six months and the right hand bank will, will get trimmed next year or the year after. It's good to have a two, three year rotation and keep some habitat going. Um, the habitat on the right is where you're going to get uh, buntings, rebunting, even yellow hammer breeding and nesting and finding feed for the young through um, vertebrates and seed heads. Another good example here of a nicely managed watercourse with um, the right hand side being recently cut and the left hand side here um, being slightly overgrown. Um, if you're a barn owl, probably you're going to find more food on the left hand side as well, as well as it being nicer for farm than birds. What also helps, you can see further down the drain there, there is a, a bit of a hawthorn tree. It's useful to think about in these long drain ditches that you have the odd shrub or hedge, because that provides a song perch for, for species like yellow hammer and reed bunting. So, some nice grass, grass margins along this drain dike here, but they can be a good habitat for owls and kestrels to hunt, but also act as a, a good buffer zone for um, uh, fertiliser runoff from the fields and also slows the movement of water from the fields into the dikes in times of heavy rain. So you can see here is a, another nice margin which is stepped with a, a longer rank glass grass near the hedge and in fact there's a bit of undergrowth happening in the bottom of the hedge that's where you'll really, the yellow hammers really like it um, and with, with a stepped verge there you, you have more, more diversity of birds uh, what's good here is it's interesting here, it's set next to a field of um, autumn sown oilseed rape. Um, perhaps oilseed rape is seen as a, a bad thing by some people in terms of the bright yellow flowers in the countryside. But actually it's, it's quite good for farmland birds. Um, reed buntings will breed on the ground in it. Um, often when you've got an oilseed rape field you'll get linnets breeding in the hedge next to it and this hedge is bushy enough to to attract linnets with a crop next to it. Um, the, the, the invertebrates you get in rape and the little seed heads of the new seeds are very attractive to small birds and in, in even species like house sparrow um, we notice in our, by our house at home in, in, in Nottinghamshire. Um, so just to point out, obviously rape has some good farm and bird wildlife benefits. Barn owls, it's, it's perhaps a myth that barn owls need lots of grass and they do but um, in areas that are dairy farmed or sheep grazed, the grass is obviously uh, grazed intensively and doesn't leave any habitat or much space for uh, short tail field voles and field mice, which are the main diet of the barn owl. Uh, whereas in these large arable landscapes, you get lots of drainage dikes, ditches, and watercourses and rivers with lovely grassy margins with uncut or rank grass. These are usually very abundant with small mammals and the owls do well and areas like Lincolnshire are one of the four or five areas in the UK that are very good for barn owls and they're mainly in arable landscapes which is perhaps not always understood. Perhaps one of the biggest uh, factors on farmland birds decline since uh, World War II is a, a change in farming uh, to autumn sowing rather than spring sowing. Uh, stubbles are were traditionally a great place with drop seed for birds to feed on through the winter and also to provide shelter. I recently went out with an image intensifier and the stubble field like this was had 20 or 30 skylark roosts in it. They weren't in the, the uh, autumn sown crop fields. You can also help birds by leaving autumn sown crops standing on the margins of fields and letting the crop fall. Um, this helps provide food for birds in what's called the hungry months from February through to March or even April. Um, uh, species like reed bunting and yellowhammer breed late and that's because 
there isn't a food for their chicks in March, April, but in May they have the young seeds and invertebrates around soft damp areas to feed their young. But the adults need that food during March and April from fallen wheat or other seed provision uh, through wild bird cover to keep them going until it's time to breed and they've got the natural supplies of invertebrates and soft seeds for their chicks. Nice to see a ditch with reeds and, and, and tall grass in it. Um, a nice habitat for sedge warbler, which is a, an African migrant, but also the, the sort of place you'll find uh, reed bunting breeding. Quite a buzz phrase um, with ecologists and the environment net, but it has been for some time, and with climate change is connectivity. Uh, along here we've got a fairly tall hedge connecting the copse there and almost connecting with the woodland over there behind the camera. Um, for, for an arable farm on landscape where you're wanting to help, uh, say, skylark and lapwing, you want a low hedge. You don't want places for um, crows to sit and watch them and then take their young or eggs. But equally, if you're looking at woodland management, woodlands are much better when they're connected to other woodlands. You need taller hedges, and that is better for species like marsh tit. Uh, marsh tit won't fly across a, t a 200 metre wide space. They need the hedgerows to commute along and travel along. Also these taller hedges can be better for bullfinch and other uh, uh, red data species, uh, chaffinch and perhaps from a bird that's no longer here that would be um, turtle dove but they like big thick high hedges. So to some, to some extent you've got to decide about what bird landscape you're designing. Is it for uh, woodland birds, or arable birds, farmland birds and how do you sort of balance that out? The skylark plots give, give the skylark somewhere to land and then um, move into the surrounding cover to nest. Skylarks have been impacted by the advent since World War II of autumn planting of cereal crops. Um, they rely on the winter stubbles for food and cover. One way you can help them with when you're sowing in the autumn is to either block um, seed drill and leave these eight square metre plots, um, perhaps two to a hectare, or you can uh, spray off plot, uh, square plots, rectangular plots, um, into the late winter. Um, Skylarks are 50% more productive when they've got these squares to land, into, land on and run into the surrounding cover to nest. Um, otherwise they're only relying on the uh, tram lines from the tractor subject to disturbance. So if, if you're just targeting um, arable farmland species like lapwing and skylark, this vista illustrates um, some of the issues quite well. This large autumn sown, I think it's a, a barley field, maybe wheat, but would benefit from having skylark plots. Um, I think it's two per hectare and a four metre square. And over here you've got some fallow wild bird cover. If that remains like that into the spring, it will be attractive to skylarks. But things you need to think about are, is, are the, the crows, crow family, going to use that birch to sit on to um, wait for the, the chicks to hatch or find the nests? In that case, if that's what you're aiming to do, you could look at coppicing that birch by the dike there, and possibly the tree just behind me. Uh, sites like this with um, uh, pollinator plants and the wild bird cover it doesn't look much at the moment but next spring it will be a mass of flowers which will provide seeds for the birds and nectar for the uh, pollinating insects. Um, that has benefits for pollinating crops as well when the rapes in flower in the spring you've got the pollinators right by it. Also research shows that planting these wild bird cover pollinator areas in blocks uh, tends to be more effective and it's nice to see it next to a hedge line. Often birds will use the hedge as a perch before they drop down into the crop to feed. So we've talked um, uh, today about providing summer food and nesting habitat but what's all important is um, winter habitat. We've talked about winter feeding. It's also about where birds might roost uh, at night in the And scrub habitat like this, this is below this looks like thorn here species like linnets and yellowhammer to roost in and the reeds behind the cameraman might be also suitable for the reed bunches if they more extensive. So barn owls are a relatively easy species to help. Um, give them a uh, 10 hectares or 25 acres of rank grassland 
which can be, as you see here, um, river banks, um, drainage dikes, and a home, which is this is run by Wildlife Conservation Partnership. Um, then they're quite easy to help. Um, they tend to breed in the up and down cycle following the fortitudes of the field vole, which tends to go boom bust over a three, four year period. But of late it has been impacted by climate change with extreme weather events. This, this type of box was designed on the fens and this is a fen type habitat. The idea being that the male can roost in the apex roof um, because there won't be many alternatives for him to roost during the breeding. Once the female's completed the clutch of eggs, at some point she kicks the male out and he needs a home too. And he brings food to the female during egg and small chick stage, then they both hunt once the chicks can control their own body temperature. Um, so, but what happened in the fens is that you find, often find barn owls are breeding inside the lower half of the box and the entrance is on the other side and the kestrels will use the top entrance of the box. And when we were last here, a, a kestrel left the box. Now whether it was inside um, the actual dark chamber or in the roof, we don't know. Farmland birds are not doomed. There is much we can do to help these wonderful creatures thrive. By focusing on providing safe nesting sites, spring and summer food for the young, and winter food and shelter, collectively known as the Big Three, we can enable these birds to prosper alongside human activity. Small changes in the way the land is farmed can make a massive difference. Simple things from thicker hedgerows at the base provide perfect breeding habitat for yellowhammers and grey partridge. Overgrown areas along drainage ditches provide breeding grounds for reed bunting and hunting grounds for barn owls. Changing from spring sowing to autumn sowing caused declines in skylark populations, but by leaving autumn sowing crop standing on the margins of fields, you can provide food through the winter months, which helps survival into the breeding season. Take a look at the links provided below for more information on the big three and how you can help farmland birds. Okay, hope everyone enjoyed that. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. No problem. I'll, um, I'll hand over to, to Jim, who's got a little something to present, and then we can open up any questions. So just a few s slides on owls and kestrels, um, providing nest boxes uh, for them. Um, so here you have an adult barn owl. That was breeding in a box in some disused barns. They, they do like old crew yards and redundant buildings where they're quiet or, or there's low levels of disturbance. Um, on the right there is a, an A-frame a box on an ash tree. Um, there was an issue potentially that owls used to use um, ash trees very much as a natural site, but with a disease that might become an issue in the next uh, decade or two. Um, but they are, as I said in the, in the video, they're quite easy to help by providing them um, artificial nest sites. And probably the bulk of the um, UK population is in artificial nest sites, which is good, but also means you've got to maintain them. Um, or nest boxes for barn owls, they, they can go on poles, as you see there, or um, a pole box on the right. Um, that has the advantage, as I was talking about earlier, that it can be sited in places where you don't have trees or buildings to uh, position them on. Um, mentioned in the video about uh, what we call the vol cycle. On the left-hand photo, you can see the uh, barn owl chicks are just hatching and a real uh, mountain of voles and mice. Voles and mice seem to go on a three or four year boom bust cycle, which is natural, but affected heavily by climate change now with uh, extreme weather conditions. And there you, there you see on the right, um, a brood of four chicks, which is a, a good sized brood. The population statisticians tell us that if they 
fledged three healthy chicks that that will help keep the population stable so some years they will fl fledge more than three and other years less than three so they are capable of actually coming back from a, a bad season quite quickly Tornial, uh, you can see an adult there that was trapped on, on, on chicks and a couple of Tornial chicks on the right um, they tend to have much smaller broods and a, a brood of two healthy chicks is, is okay for Tornial. Uh, Tornial box uh, going up on the right um, a few weeks ago, probably too late for this year. Uh, there's another adult Tornial that was caught breeding. You might notice this one's actually quite gingery. And in the previous slide, there was a dark bird. They tend to have these two color morphs. What's interesting to me here is you see different colors of flight feathers. Uh, on, the, on what we call the primaries and the secondaries. That's because most birds of prey molt their flight feathers over several years in order that they maintain um, you know, flight and hunting capacity. And the females usually do this post-breeding. Uh, little owl, perhaps in decline, but quite oft, often found uh, uh, quite widespread. Interestingly, they arrived in the UK, um, reintroduced species in the 19th century, spread quite um, rapidly and now fairly sedentary. But you should now, if you've got them, be hearing them, the males calling at, uh, uh, you know, just before first light they when they're claiming their territories. This is um, a box designed by a Lincolnshire guy called Alan Ball. These sort of designs of boxes which actually have, you can see in the top left there, an entrance tunnel and then it drops down, gives them a, a dark area to nest in. These boxes work really well in redundant buildings like old crew yards. You can see three chicks on the right. Kestrels, um, as an adult, caught one winter there on the left. It's a kestrel box I just put up on, um, literally this week on the right hand side, on the side of a farm building. Um, kestrel boxes are normally open fronted and, and quite reasonably high, say five meters. The, the hen likes to have a clear open view, but they will nest on uh, farm buildings where it's reasonably quiet. Kestrel chicks at different stages there, less than a week old and um, the, on, the, on the right there getting towards three weeks old. They're Quite easy to help too by, as I say, by putting boxes on trees or buildings, um, but, but preferably in open landscapes, not woodland. That's it. Thanks, Jim. That was, uh, yeah, that was that was really interesting. Uh, Lewis, do you want me to do the question, or do you want to take the questions? Lead if you like. Now we've got one from uh, Jim Wright. Shall I, shall I read this out, Jim? You can do, yes. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Um, Jim's asking, Jim, uh, if a hedgerow is too low, some birds' nests are vulnerable to both ground and avian predators, what would you say is the minimum height of a hedgerow to provide a safe nesting habitat for some birds? I'd say probably about a meter and a half. Um, it, as I was alluding to in the video, it very much depends on uh, what bird you're aiming at. But for example, yellow hammers will often nest, have their first brood very low down in the undergrowth next to the hedge. I think perhaps because the top of the hedge is still into coming to leaf and is more open, therefore more vulnerable, and they're more likely to have their second breed you know, higher up in the hedge. Big bushy hedges are better for things like bullfinch if you've got, you know, hedges that are four to five metres high um, and, and uh, finch species like chaffinch and um, goldfinch. So, so there's not a, you know, an easy answer. You, you often see white throat um, in what I call shortish hedges. But, uh, I mean, Kirsty might have some thoughts. She's been around the houses on hedgerows a few times as well, I would say. Um. Yeah, I don't know around houses, but um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think the height question is perhaps, it is important, but I'd also add obviously the structure itself of the hedge, the complexity of it and how how um, easy or difficult it is for a predator to get in is probably more important than the actual height of the hedge. I think that's what you're alluding to Jim, as well. So, uh, you know, a yellow hammer, one of Jim's yellow hammers nesting a foot from the ground, as long as that is in the midst of really dense, uh, perhaps thorny 
growth that's actually quite well protected um, it's where you have hedges that haven't been managed ideally and they've got quite an open structure you can see through them really easily and winter um, those are the ones where actually it's quite easy as you were saying for different predators to get in and possibly um, uh, impact the eggs and chicks thanks that's Kirsty for that um Jenny, did that answer your bullfinch question or yeah sorry i had a specific uh, species it was in on the same topic about the height of the head why um do taller hedges um suit bullfinches um for example the reason i ask that we've got a good population of uh, bullfinches at the country park um where i work and there's a program of hedge laying so i was sort of thinking <laughs> is there a conflict there well, I think the um, hedge laying is good, but as long as you do it in rotation, you don't, um, you know, lay the whole lot at once. They will grow into those thick, bushy hedges that Kirsty was referring to, which have good thick bases, but also uh, uh, eventually will have after five, ten years, um, you know, a wide open top as well. Um, bullfinches don't like flying across large open spaces, a bit like marsh tits, and. Uh, one of the management techniques in Kent, where I think they can still be shot in orchards under the H1 Act. Um, one technique to make the orchards less friendly, to, you know, less tempting in terms of the apple blossom buds um, to bullfinches was to um, have a big gap between the orchard and the boundaries because the, the bullfinches don't like open spaces. Um, they do seem to like linear habitat and um, or scrub. Um, I, I used to run in a scrub site one time and, and, and caught quite a few bullfinches. But they, they did seem to like connectivity. Okay, so once a hedge has been laid, what's the sort of ideal time to relay it? Would you leave it up to sort of 10 years, do you think, before you, you re relay it? I, I'm not qualified to answer that one, but I, I've, my understanding, again, Kirsty might add more, is that you do it on about a 25 year cycle. I suspect it depends on your um, objectives. People are, are laying new hedges when they're seven years old, which strikes me as they're not that, that well established. Thank you. But again, I say Kirsty might have some thoughts as well. well I'll, I'll got a picture that you'll see later of, um, of one of your youngish hedges that probably was laid at about 10 years old. Um, uh, and yes, I'd agree with you, Jim, actually, in terms of laying intervals, it totally depends how it's been managed in between it. So I, I do know a small number of land managers who will say, I'll lay a hedge and I will not do anything to it until I lay it again. But their interval might be quite smaller than that 25 year period. Whereas most people would do some management in, in the meantime through one or other different tools and you probably have a longer laying interval. And it also depends a little bit on the species that are there. Um, so a thorn hedge will, will uh, last longer between laying but I've seen hedges that are almost entirely hazel and hazel puts on a lot of growth every year. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit, little bit rule of thumb and just assessing each one based on its own merit. Thanks Kirsty. Shall we just, so I've just got one question from Lewis and then we'll move on to uh, Kirsty's uh, presentation and then we can go back into a general discussion after then, that. Yeah, so. Just a quick question. Uh, Jim, you mentioned about um, our boxes needing maintenance um is that specific like maintaining the box itself or removing sort of debris from previous um clutches i, I asked specifically we've had a thorny owl box put up just in some trees out, outside the house and i'm wondering the people that put it up might just leave it to sort of do its own business so i was wondering how in terms of maintenance um well, there's the physical maintenance of the box, and I've had problems in recent years with the quality of plywood. Um, so I've had to replace repair boxes. Um, some boxes I put up in 2000 and they're still fine. Um, it, it helps if generally if they're north or northeast facing because they don't catch the sun and equally don't get prevailing rain coming into the box. So that can be better for the breeding birds and better for the boxes sort of shelf life, if you like. Um, in terms of internal maintenance, you like um, with tall owl boxes, it can you can get issues with um, squirrels or jackdaws. Um, if you think squirrels are using it, they aren't, you know you really want to be clearing cleaning locks out about January time. Um, leave it much later, and the tall owls won't won't use it. Um, 
Um, jackdaws sometimes will partially fill the box or completely fill the box and reduce the size of it till it suits them. Um, and they would need clear, clearing out, um, uh, you know, again in your in, in the winter. In clearing out any of the boxes, be be aware that stock doves are very opportunistic and will just pop into a box and lay eggs within um, a few days of it becoming vacant by its previous user. So if you start pulling stuff out, just be aware that there might be a couple of little white eggs in there. Um, didn't mention stock doves previously, but their their conservation status is orange. But they they will use nearly all the boxes I mentioned earlier. Well, they will use barn owl and um, uh, tulip owl boxes. In a way, you don't need to do bespoke boxes for them. They, they'll either you visit the boxes and use them after the um, the owls, or they will use the boxes the owls aren't using or the owls aren't using. Um, barn owl boxes about with occupied barn owl boxes about a third are used all the year round and you probably need to clean those out every two or three years in the winter just because just fill up with um barn owl guano to the point where the box becomes too small and either the owls are a bit exposed because they're sitting near the entrance or just won't use it um and then the same issues around um jackdaws and squirrels as, as, as toy owl boxes um, little owl boxes sometimes they do need clean out because little owls will basically um in a very wet year when they can't get the food the right food i.e small birds or uh, small mammals for their chicks will bring back an awful lot of worms and this applies to tawny owls too sometimes and basically they're feeding their chicks worms and then um as you can imagine the worms are about a bit like a cucumber they're mostly water so then the the box can almost become flooded so sometimes they need cleaning out and um putting a bit of sawdust or something in just to get the box dry. Thanks for that, that Jim. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I think we've got the picture on <laughs> we've got the picture on that one. No, that's yeah. that's really good. It's, you know, it's um yeah. Is, does that answer yeah. your question, Liz? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um I've got a very quick one from Mike which uh, Mike Pinnett, which uh, if you don't mind, Mike, I'll just read to uh, Jim. Which is, do you have a cutting plan for the A-frame style box? Um, I, I do, and I can share it with um, uh, Lewis to, to send on if yeah. you like. Thanks, thanks for that, Jim. Yeah. So um, we'll uh, we'll now move on to uh, Kirsty and uh, take her presentation next. And then we can have a, a more of a general um, discussion. Well, we'll take specific questions to Kirsty first, and then we'll open it up to a more general discussion. Okay. So, thank you, Christine. Thank you. Grand. Well, thank you very much for um, letting me join your workshop this afternoon. Um, it's really nice to see you all. Um, so, I've been talked, asked to talk a bit about farm and birds specifically with regard to um, the countryside stewardship scheme. Um, and I try to tailor it as much as I can to the, to the Ancon Valley. Um, so, but before I get into the detail, just a bit about um, myself and Oak Bank, who I work for. Uh, Oak Bank, um, you might not have come across us. Um, we started in 2004 as a specialist seed company, providing uh, seed for game cover and agri-environment schemes. But we've grown substantially since then, um, and we're now um, specialist supplier of advice and materials to farms and estates of all shapes and sizes. We have staff uh, in all corners of England, although our main office is in Cambridgeshire. So I work out of out of Oxfordshire down here. And for the sake of clarity, um, I should point out that although Jim Pace is in the centre of that photograph there, he's not actually on our payroll that I know of anyway. So yes, my, my day to day job is working with farmers um, uh, on agri environment schemes, giving them advice up front help them with grant applications and then we see it right through to the point of delivery through to plants actually growing in the ground and things changing which is great. Um, from a farmer's point of view why, why should they care about the environment anyway? Um, after all farming is all about providing food which we're very fond of, um, it can provide fibres and fuel um, but as we all know farming provides a lot more than that. It's, uh, it impacts our water, it can help with soil conservation and regeneration as Christine was saying at the beginning. Um, it, can help, it can help mitigate climate change, it provides beautiful landscapes, it provides wildlife habitat, lots of different things that farming provides. Um, pretty much only one of them that they get paid directly though, um, it's quite difficult for a farmer to receive payments 
from for those other outputs from agriculture. But the flip side of this is that farming itself relies on a healthy environment to produce all of that. Um, it needs these natural processes like a nutrient cycle, it needs healthy soil, it needs pollination services to provide food, also things like dung burial working and, and natural control of um, plant pests and diseases. So actually the farm business itself is totally reliant on having um, a well-functioning and healthy environment um, and natural processes going on. I think sometimes we lose track of that a little bit. Countryside stewardship. I'm going to talk a little bit about this because it's at the moment it is the main source of financial support for farmers to do uh, what we call wildlife friendly measures on their land, um, including those that directly benefit farm and birds. Now, the whole system of agricultural support is, is changing quite quickly at the moment from where we were and have been for the last 50 years under the common agricultural policy and having direct payments to farmers based on the area of land they produce. Um, and countryside stewardship has kind of sat alongside that as it's as a, as a smaller pot of money. We're now in a process where we are moving towards a new system um, where those direct payments to farmers will only happen in response, in, in, um, in exchange for um, what they're calling public goods. All those things that farming produces, but which there isn't a market for. So wildlife habitat, climate change mitigation, beautiful landscapes, clean water, all of that. So that's where we're moving to, but at the moment we're kind of in the middle of that change process. Um, so I'm going to talk about the scheme that's open to people right now. And there are there are new schemes being uh, emerging even this week and being developed that will come out in another few years. Um, but I'm just going to look at the things that are available right now, because most obvious. Um, so countryside stewardship is, is voluntary. Um, no one twists anyone's arm to take part. Um, and most um, scheme agreements between the farmer and the government, they last for five years most of them, but there are a couple of exceptions. At the moment, as I said, it is open to people to join now, and we expect new agreements to be offered until 2023, at which point the replacement scheme, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, or ELM, will start to be rolled out. As I said, even this week, um, some of the pilot elements of that new scheme um, are being started, um, something called the Sustainable Farming Initiative, you might have heard about in the press. The government has uh, just opened uh, for expressions of interest by farmers to take part in a pilot with that. And the idea is that the full replacement scheme of ELM um, will start to roll out from 2024, but it will be quite a gradual process. It will last for several years until it is fully rolled out. There are quite a few farmers uh, and they're going, well, you know what, I'm just going to sit it out for a few years until the new scheme is there. It's important to realise that I think that new scheme is quite a way off in terms of time um, and actually there are things that people can do now that will pay them and uh, make a big difference from the point of view of wildlife and farm and birds. Um, and it's quite reassuring for them to know that if they go into the scheme that's currently available, that if the new replacement scheme is actually better for them and they want to move over to it, they can do that um, early without having to pay back the monies that they've had so far. So it's kind of an assurance that they're not losing out on anything in the future by starting something now. What we'd today suggest is that countryside stewardship today can can be useful in providing that financial support to get some of uh, some of the features that take a long time to get established um, to do so, and also improving some of the infrastructure around farms, so making making good farming easier. Um, that's what it's all about. You may well um, be aware of, or, or some land managers will already be in um, some sort of stewardship scheme. The previous iteration was called environmental stewardship, and there are still some people with uh, what they call higher level stewardship or HLS agreements that are most of the way through, but still have a little bit of time to run. Um, as those agreements, those older ones, start to expire, then what you tend to find is um, the uh, people administering the scheme, uh, which is the Rural Paints Agency, will approach those folk and say, um, would you like to extend your current scheme? Um, just roll it on as it is for another 12 months, um, no changes. Um, and that can be quite uh, quite tempting for a lot of people. Um, so for people in those situations, we, we put together this little um, pros and cons of whether it's better to stick with an existing older scheme or move into the one that's currently available now. So this is getting a little bit technical, um, but for example, just to pick out a few of these, um, uh, a landowner might be in a position where their current agreement expires quite early in the calendar year, say for example March, in which case for the rest of the calendar year they wouldn't be getting any of those um, payments for environmental works because all the new schemes start in January. So that would be a downside of um, moving to a new one because you'd have that payment gap. 
for farms that have a lot of um, grassland being sensitively managed and being paid for that, then actually some of the payment rates um, were better actually in the previous scheme to what's on offer right now. So for, um, for farms with a lot of grassland, it might be better to stick. However, on the plus side, on the other side, um, uh, the newest scheme allows people to um, access funding for capital items, these one-off works that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. Quid pro quo, variable option payments tend to be slightly better in the new scheme than they were in the previous. And again, you're kind of guaranteeing, from a farmer's point of view, they're guaranteeing that they know the payments they're going to get for the next five years. So in terms of managing budgets, um, that's quite helpful. So I'm not going to dwell on every one of those little points because um, it is a little bit technical, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that people have to weigh up in their minds when they're in that situation. Let's look at what's on offer at the moment. You might have heard of some of these terms, but I'll just unpack them a little bit for you. The countryside stewardship has different components to it, different tiers, um, and the first one is called the higher tier. Now this has the widest range of um, options, that is um, uh, options for land management that they would get paid for and expect to do every year, um, as well as capital items, those one-off works. Um, however, um, the access to that higher tier does depend on um, another organisation called Natural England. Natural England acts as kind of the technical specialists that support um, scheme administrators. And they tend to have to give priority to designated sites like triple SIs. So not everyone can get into higher tier. However, the next one down, the mid tier, um, uh, now this has a slightly smaller range of land management options. Um, but that has been expanded. So most things that most farms need and would be appropriate for, you can access in mid-tier. It also has the capital items with things like hedge restoration, fencing. Um, uh, there are some limits on the, the, the values um, that people can put in for capital items. Um, but it is supposed to be competitive. So there's a fixed budget per year um, for mid-tier agreements. So anybody who tries to, to apply for it, you're up against everybody else and you're never quite sure who else you're up against really. Um, in so in theory it is competitive, in reality most good applications will get an agreement. There are um, simplified versions of it here as well, these so-called wildlife offers. Um, so these have a much narrower menu of land management options and there's no capital items available there. However, it is not competitive, so as long as you um, choose the right amount of options from the right menu, you're guaranteed an agreement. So that's quite useful for some simple situations and the application process itself is much easier and, and takes less time as well so that's a big plus. And lastly there is a newly revamped um, capital grants component as well so there's just payments for capital items whether those are items that are intended to help um, protect water quality such as fencing or um, CSF is capital sensitive farming items uh, or boundary items again things like hedge restoration, um, tree pollarding, things like that. Um, would be boundary items and again a little detail but for the first time this year even if you are one of those people with an older higher level stewardship agreement you can now actually apply for this, these capital grants um, which is very helpful for a lot of people but those are the different components of countryside stewardship that farmers can access um, right now i'm going to look at a few of the, the land management options that particularly benefit wildlife and from the farm and bird perspective we'll just look at a few Obviously, there's quite a few that we can, uh, I'm not going to cover them all, but perhaps we can discuss those later. Um, so things to, um, uh, this this one, I'm speaking codes, so I'm not going to try to do that one, but the code is AB1. So this is a, called a nectar flower mix. And what it is, is um, an option to encourage and pay people to provide, uh, to create areas that are sewn down to a fairly simple mix of legumes and wildflowers. Um, no grass in this particular one. So examples would include um, a few clovers, maybe some birds for trefoil, some simple vetches, um, some plantain, things like that. Um, and from the farmer's point of view, this can be used to um, uh, take out awkward areas that are perhaps a little bit difficult to get large machinery in for arable cropping. Um, and instantly you're creating habitat um, that's great for wild pollinators, it's great for um, predators of pests. It's really instantaneous, lots of flowers, lots of insects. And we've got some pictures there of a couple of examples and these things really do buzz so they're fantastic um, from a practical point of view as well they are what they call rotational options so during the course of your five-year agreement you can actually move it around either within the same field or between fields as well so a, a, a so mix like this would perhaps last three might be last five years but if you wanted to move it um, then you could do and there are other rotational options available in the scheme whereby you can just swap the areas over 
and there are good um, farming reasons why that can be quite helpful in terms of controlling um, undesirable weeds and things that will become a problem for them. One thing to be aware of with this particular option is um, uh, the, the, the plants that you grow, they are intended and the farmers do have to actually cut half of that area in the early summer. Um, that sounds quite dumb and people often look at this and why are you cutting these flowers in June? That sounds crazy. But the intention is that those plants then reflower towards the end of August, September, even into early October. And so they're providing late season um, pollen and nectar just when things like cream bumblebees are about to hibernate and they need to build their reserves. So that, that cutting of some of it helps along the flowering period. And then all of it is cut at the end of the flowering season completely so that um, they're, they're not getting um, surface vegetation that stops the plants coming back with spring. So it's carefully thought out. Um, another um, option, um, this one is, is non-rotational, so this stays in place for the whole duration of the agreement. And this one, the AB8 mixture is a little bit different because it includes grasses. So it's grasses, it's probably a wider range of native wildflowers, kind of like a little bit of a simplified hay meadow really, um, but one that's very flexible in area. So again, this can be used for farmers to take out um, areas that might be a little bit awkward to get into, or parts of fields or even whole fields that don't yield very well. And then they're getting a guaranteed payment every year on, on, that, on that field or that area. And again, these are great for wildflowers, they're great for insects. And from a farm and bird point of view, insects are food. So these are fantastic sources of insect food for almost all the birds that Jim was talking about earlier, because almost all of them rely on insects to feed their chicks in the spring and summer. Um, and when you've got an edge, like you can see in that picture there, you've got good access for those birds to get in there and actually find the insects as well. Um, and uh, a farmer would manage an area like this once it's established um, as, a, as a hay meadow effectively. So they would um, uh, usually be cutting most of it or, or even grazing it off if they had livestock. Um, but they are encouraged to leave a little bit of it standing over winter. And the reason that's important is that a lot of insects um, overwinter in standing vegetation. And so by, by leaving some of it, you're leaving that, those, in, those overwintering insects ready to, to emerge the next spring and summer and build up their numbers again. So these are great. Um, these are great foraging areas for all sorts of species. Um, uh, the one thing you do have to be a little bit careful of is obviously if you were in that um, nectar flower mix that we looked at previously, um, that is cut early on, then um, we would always encourage people to check for things like partridge nesting in there before they cut. So there's a little bit of a, a risk, but hopefully we can make some nice attractive habitat for partridge to nest in elsewhere. Um, this is a, an illustration of a site that um, um, I've worked on recently. You can see in the right hand corner there, if you look very carefully, there's a little bit of grass behind, behind the house there. That's where the field has had, had a little bit of a curve to it. It didn't make sense to crop it. Um, so that will be an ideal spot for one of these mixes to go in. Or if they were feeling really brave, they could be actually even create that plot right out to the telegraph wires. If you've got very, very large farming equipment and actually getting underneath the telegraph wires, there's a little bit of a risk that you don't want to take. They're always looking for all those win-wins. Where can we get the wildlife habitat where it's going to be, uh, make the farmer's life as, as easy as possible and as efficient as possible um, and save them a bit of money. Um, uh, uh, the other thing that Jim mentioned is, is a lot of our farmland birds, they need seed in the winter. And a lot of our farm landscapes, that's quite hard to come by nowadays. Um, uh, so this option, this winter bird food mix option, IB9, is a fantastic way of providing food for farmland birds in the winter. Um, uh, it basically pays farmers to grow a mixture of several um, small seed bearing type plants and grow them as a crop. Um, and uh, when they're successful like these, you have enormous quantities of winter seed food um, for all farm and birds. Uh, there is a, a minimum block size of 0.4 of a hectare. So we don't want areas of this mix that are too small or too thin, because what you find is at, along the edges, you tend to, the seed gets lost very quickly um, due to poor weather or, um, or, or other things coming and eating it. So bigger blocks um, last for longer in terms of their seed during the winter. Not also easier for the farmers to manage well and make sure that they're yielding really well like this for their seed. Um, there's lots of different types of um, plants that crop types that farmers can put in these mixes. There's a very few that they can't, um, but with the right, with a smart choice of the of the seed mix type, then they can usually control weeds that would be a problem from the future. Um, and uh, you can also either uh, type seed mixes that last for one winter 
you put them in spring, they'd have the seed in the winter, and then the following spring you'd re-sow them again. Or sometimes you can have mixtures that last for two years. If they've got a crop in there called kale because kale lasts for two years. And again, with a bit of smart choice, you can put plants in there that have some pollen nectar value as well. Um, so they're great for uh, food rearing cover for, for things like young partridge chicks. So you can use these in really creative ways and it's, it's a good option. Um, and this is one of those other options that is rotational that can be moved around the farm. So uh, what we often do is design a scheme so that you've got that nectar flower mix that we looked at first of all, and your winter bird food mix nearby in similar areas so that the farm has the option to be able to swap them around midway through their agreement and just keep them, keep them really fresh and keep them yielding well. There is a payment as well. There's this, this option here for supplementary winter feeding. Um, so this is literally um, going out once or twice a week through the winter from December through to, through to the end of April and literally pushing out a seed mix on tracks on the ground um, for farm birds. And the reason that's important is because even with that um, winter bird seed mix, that crop mix that we looked at just now, what you can find is that the seed is quite depleted after, right after Christmas. And so you're left with this period from about January through to about now we've made April, where actually if you're a seed eating bird, there's not a lot left in the countryside. And we call this the hunger gap. And supplementary feeding by hand like this is actually one of the most reliable ways of, of filling that hungry gap. Now this option is, is actually tied to the previous one in that uh, farmers can uh, apply for up to half a tonne of this supplementary feeding mix for every one hectare of the winter bird food that they're growing. So they're tied to each other like that. And it can include a little bit of their own cereal for arable farmers who want to use some of their own wheat or barley and they include they can include up to 70 percent of that and if they want to put a little bit through hoppers if they've got a gain interest as well they can do a little bit of that well but the idea is that the most of it um, goes straight on the ground um, and then it's definitely got to include that small seed component which is really important for a lot of our smaller farmer birds like yellow hammers finches other buntings and things like that i thought i'd put this one in as well because it's an interesting option and um, that's not been around for that many years and this is a uh, catchly titled the two years sown legume fallow but what it is, it's a mixture of um, simple grasses and simple um, legumes and wildflowers. It's quite a simple mix. But the idea is that it goes in after harvest and it lasts the first winter all of the following year and then second year through to the summer as well. So it's lasting two years. And the idea is that actually this is, this is a soil health option, really, primarily, because you're putting plants into the soil for a long period of time. Those roots are going down. Um, the plant, when it's photosynthesizing, is um, uh, emitting carbon, uh, exudates through its roots, and those exudates are feeding the soil microbiology, all the bacteria and um, other associated mi microbes that are so important to getting our soil nutrient cycling going. Um, there, it has some nitrogen fixing legumes in there, so it's fixing nitrogen for free. Um, so it's by the end of the, the two years, actually, what you're coming out with is hopefully a soil that's in better health. And therefore can yield better for the next time that the farmer needs a, with a cash crop. It can also help control problem weed farmers. Um, there's one called black grass which is, can be particularly problematic um, and that's uh, the reason it can help do that is because during its first spring um, you're encouraged to, to cut it at least twice um, and if you're cutting it before your black grass has seeded uh, then actually you're removing the source of that seed going back into the seed bed. Um, and what you find is the, the grass elements in the seed mix itself, ryegrass and cocksfoot, they tend to be quite good at outcompeting black grass. So again, after two years, any problem black grass areas we find are much reduced, which is really good. Um, however, although it's, uh, it's mostly about soil health, um, because it's got lots of wildflowers in there as well, it's great um, for wild pollinators and it's great as an insect resource and foraging area for farm and birds. Um, and in fact, uh, farmers have to leave this to flower in its second spring. Although in its first year it was cut quite a lot, in its second spring it's allowed to flower. And as you can see in that photo there, you just get this mass of clovers and vetches and things like that. So you get this super abundance of um, nectar and pollen, which attracts lots of insects. There are some options, um, so moving away from arable for a little bit, there are there are some options for wet grassland, which um, obviously is really important in the ank home. There's a couple, um, uh, there's one for exists, so these ones are for existing areas of wet grassland. And there's two different ones depending on whether you're targeting breeding waders, um, so waders that are there in the spring and summer, or whether it's um, attractive and, and supporting wintering waders and wildfowl. And you'll see the two different payment rates there. Now, these options can be accessed in, through the mid tier, but um, uh, only certain areas are eligible for it. Um, and those tend to be areas of floodplain grazing, marsh, 
um, that have been recorded as priority habitat and where um, you've got evidence that you've either got waders for that first one or wintering waders and wildfowl for the second one. So someone might be very lucky and already be in an eligible area or actually they might have to do a bit of work to show that they're eligible for those particular options. There are options for creating these wet grasslands as well though. Um, so you can get paid to turn arable land back into wet grassland, either for breeding waders again, or for wintering waders and wildfowl. So obviously they have slightly different requirements. However, these options are only available through the higher tier. Um, so a little bit more work required. And um, uh, these options also last for 10 years rather than usual. Obviously, we, we, want, we, want the, the, we, don't, we want those features to be long lasting really. We don't really want people to be putting them back into arable afterwards. Um, so it is possible and you may well have nice little lapwing chicks as a result like that one, um, but they do take a little bit of uh, work to get to, so they have to be really right. And just as the last example of something that we'll look at in detail, um, bus strips obviously are a really um, uh, basic and commonplace and essential part of the menu of, of, of stewardship options, uh, and particularly for landscapes like this. Um, so there are payments for um, good sized arable buffer strips. Um, they have to be at least four meters wide and can be up to six. Um, and they're used to protect environmental features, whether that's a, a ditch, a watercourse, a hedge. Um, the paid for area can't overlap with public rights of way and they can't be used for um, vehicle or, or livestock access as well. So you do have to think a little bit about carefully about where's best to put them. Farmers who have these options are encouraged to cut, to cut um, some of the crop side half of it um, uh, from mid-July onwards. Um, and this, space, this helps encourage a bit of diversity of vegetation structure. Remember Jim and his video looking at those stepped margins, it kind of makes that sort of area. So you have the crop side area, which would be um, uh, mown every year, for example, and that keeps the taller area quite accessible for birds to get into either as nesting cover or to find the insect that they're in there as well. So what you find is the, um, the part of it further away from the crop should be left to go tussocky. Um, you don't want it scrubbing over, but it should definitely have a really rough grassland, which is great for foraging owls, great cover for things like reed bunting, nesting yellowhammer. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of things that love these, love these buffer strips. Um, there are some um, capital items as well that I just wanted to touch on. Um, uh, so things like um, fencing, um, sheep netting and gates. Um, these can all be really important, um, not only to stop your cows ending up on the wrong side of the river, as this one was, she looked quite surprised to see us, um, but to protect those environmental features. Um, obviously, if you're in a livestock area or possibly you're in an area with really high deer pressure, then you may well need to fence off things like hedgerows to prevent the base getting browsed out. Or if you've just restored a hedgerow and it's newly laid, you may well need to fence, back fence it to keep things from nibbling it when you don't want to. Um, or even to stop to prevent stuff from getting into watercourses and ditches and allowing that vegetation to grow up and provide nice nesting cover for um, all sorts of wildlife. Um, a bit specifically on hedgerows because they're so important for lots of our farm and birds. Um, it's important to realise that actually when someone goes into a countryside stewardship agreement they are signing up to um, no more than half of the hedgerows on their on that agreement area in any one particular year so automatically you're getting um, probably an improvement on what is often the status quo um, but they can also get paid for good hedgerow management directly so it's not very much it's eight pounds per hundred meters on one side which isn't isn't an enormous quantity but it's something um, and there are payments for new hedgerows, so you can get paid to plant new hedgerows where those are either um, restoring um, hedges that used to be there historically. You can look back on the historic maps and see where those were um, to extend existing areas of hedge or link bits of habitat or even use them to reduce um, runoff and, and uh, pollution pathways as well. You can intercept the hedge and that works quite well. Um, so that's worth being aware of. And there are also payments for hedgerow restoration as well, as we um, mentioned earlier. So this is a classic example of a bit of hedge. It's got lots of elder in it. The elder's dying back and you can see you can see straight through it. So there's nice to that hedge. It's not going to last. It needs it needs gapping up, really. So there are payments for hedgerow coppicing, um, where you're cutting it down to quite a low level and letting it sprout in from the base, and also for gapping up where you've got issues like this going on. And here's that hedge that was uh, fairly recently laid, as uh, I mentioned earlier. So there are payments under country stewardship for hedge laying, um, and also a supplement for what they call top binding stakes. So you can see the top binding along the top there, and the stakes, um, classic Midland style. Um, this hedge was put in through an older HLS agreement, so that would have been just over 10 years ago, 
my undergraduate was ready for laying in a new in a countryside citizenship agreement. And they've done a really good job, actually. It's, it looks great. And of course, that not only keeps the top of the shrubs alive, but it will have new growth from the base as well. But the dry hedge laying provides such an enormous quantity of new growth and, and um, great structure after the initial laying. So if I were the yellow hammer, I'd be very, I'd be looking forward to that enormously. I was just going to skip through a little bit about how people actually get into this scheme, because uh, it's useful to be aware of, even if you're not directly involved. As I say, the scheme administered by the Rural Payments Agency um, and the online hub called Rural Payments is very important in making it all work. So anyone who wants to apply to country stewardship, you have to be registered on that site. You have to have a DEFRA customer reference number. You've obviously got to have control of the land as well. So for most freehold farmers, that's not a problem, but tenants, if their tenancy is less than five years, they might have their landlord countersign their application. All your details have to be right. This is quite bureaucratic stuff, but things like your email address being right, um, having the correct areas of land mapped um, is actually quite important, um, uh, particularly things like farmyards, which often haven't been mapped in the past, uh, and making sure that basically all those records on that site are correct, and they're not often. Um, and that the person who is making the application is authorised to make that application. That's something called the permission settings. Uh, I mentioned those wildlife offers earlier as part one of the um, tiers of uh, countryside stewardship. Um, this is all done online um, and for an arable farming offer, for example, it's, the application itself is done online through that rural payments hub. Um, there are a few uh, situations where it's not appropriate to use it. So if you've got a, a triple SI on your land, you can't use the farming offer route. Um, and if you want to uh, include organic conversion or organic payment, then you can't use the wildlife offer route either. But basically, as long as you are willing to put at least 3% of the farm's area into some of these options that we talked about, um, and there's a, there's a little short menu, short menu there, um, then you're guaranteed, you're guaranteed an agreement. So it's asking them to, to, to deliver, to, to prompt to get to delivering um, at least 1% of their land as some sort of flower resource um, for those insects and, and further up the food chain, the farmland birds, and a minimum of 2% of that winter bird food. So it's very simple. And you know, from the point of view of something like a yellow hammer or a linnet, that's almost all of their life cycle needs um, met. So it's it's kind of designed to, to meet the needs of all farmland birds and um, our pollinators. But actually there's no maximum area that people can apply for. So they can put in a lot more than that if they want to. Uh, farmers have the ability to be quite selective as to uh, which areas they put into these schemes. So they don't have to put the whole farm in. If they want to, they can just choose certain fields. Um, if they do have a triple SI or a scheduled entry monument, they have to include those fields. So they've got to be part of the agreement. Um, and we tend to exclude woodland because there's not, um, there are different schemes which are better set up for woodland. So we tend not to put them into this one. And of course, if they are looking at um, any future developments, any fields, also fields that might um, uh, get sold off or, or be built on or, or otherwise change quite radically, it's, it's safer not to include those as well. There's quite a few online resources that can help people um, when they're thinking about these sorts of schemes, though. Um, uh, if you Google countryside stewardship grants, you'll get to all the detail of all of the options and capital items um, that I just talked about and a whole range more. So all the detail is, is through countryside stewardship grants page. Um, there's a site called Magic Maps. Again, if you Google Magic Maps, you'll uh, find uh, a rich source of information about where your triple size and schedule pension monuments are, where your priority habitat is, what eligible options you'll, uh, might be appropriate for you. Um, there's lots of good stuff there. I often look at this one um, that the Environment Agency has about surface, surface flooding risk. Um, so this isn't flooding from rivers um, or coastal flooding. This is flooding um, surface runoff when it rains heavily, where does it tend to lie? Where does it tend to, to run? And the darker the colours, the most uh, more likely it is to stay wet. And this can be really helpful in understanding um, where it might be good for, for example, pond creation or restoration, um, where those, where which bits of arable fields might not yield quite so well because they tend to stay damp. Um, so this is quite a useful thing to look at as well. Um, uh, again, if you Google wild pollinator and farm wildlife package, you can find the details of those um, those packages of some of the options that people are encouraged to report together because from an e ecological point of view they make sense they work well together and there's also a list of um, ecological and um, uh, broad environmental priorities that are specific to this area the central Lincolnshire Vale so again people can look at that and go okay well you're encouraging people to look after the plain grazing marsh or, or, or hedgerows or whatever it is 
specific to this landscape. And historic maps as well. Um, I, I like the uh, old maps from the, uh, the National Library of Scotland maps are really, really quite interesting as well as a, as a resource. Um, and the reason I like those particular ones is you can do a side by side look. Um, for example, this little snippet here gives a side by side look of um, how an area uh, looked. I think that was the 1880s uh, map. Uh, and you can have compare that with an aerial view of now or, or, or any other kind of map that you choose. Um, it's really quite fun. Of course, the whole idea with when you're talk, putting together one of these environmental schemes is um, uh, you want to start off by protecting what's there already. Um, so if you've got an environmental feature like a watercourse, you want to start off by protecting that or a ditch, ponds, hedgerows, all these features that are likely to already be there. Those are your priorities to protect what's existing. And then you can look to extend and um, uh, building stepping stones and create new features. Um, from a first point of view as well, they may also want to be looking at actually where's where's this going to work best for me? Where are my poorer yielding arable areas um, uh, that uh, actually it might make sense to put them in something that delivers more for wildlife? Um, and those areas might be things that are shaded by wood or that lie wet or quite small for, for big machinery to, uh, to turn around in. And you can see that yield mapping there that most um, modern harvesters have some yield maps. You can see that the area on the, below the wood in the bottom corner um, was quite poorly. So that would, for example, might be a good place to put um, an exoflower mix, for example, or, or possibly even a winter bird seed mix. I've given a, a few uh, examples of some of the typical options that would suit an area like central Lincolnshire. Um, we've run through quite a few of them already, um, but, but not all of them. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was as part of those application process, they do have to complete something called a farm environment record. So this is a very, very simple mapping exercise of the key features that are already on the farm. Um, it would include having to mark on any areas that are at risk of surface runoff or erosion. And this is important because it informs the choice of options for downing. So if you know that a field um, has a steep slope and is running down to river, for example, you show it on this map. And that supports um, uh, if you wanted to put in options, management options that will pay you to mitigate that risk, like a big buffer strip, for example. Uh, you mark on your roadside hedges, those with trees, infill trees, things like that. In terms of some of the farm infrastructure, those capital items that we talked about, um, there are a whole range of uh, capital items that are, are intended to protect water quality. Um, so this is useful in itself, but also if you think about the amount of wildlife that depends on having really high quality water, it's important from a wildlife point of view as well. Um, and what you'll find is on, um, on that Magic Maps site that I mentioned just now, um, people will be able to find out whether they are in a, a, a medium or a high uh, water quality priority area. And this, this screenshot that I've given here shows that those white areas are not in a priority area for water quality, which is a good thing. Uh, if you're yellow, then you're in a medium priority water quality area. And if you're red, you are in a, a high priority area for water quality. And this means you're, you can access different types of capital items. So everybody can access things like fencing to protect environmental features. Um, if you're in the yellow area, you can access um, uh, funding for things like stone and gateways so that the, the mud from them doesn't end up in the water courses. Um, you can build gate, uh, new livestock troughs and hard bases. Again, things that help um, prevent poaching and ending up in our water courses and causing sediment problems. And if you're in the red area, then you can access actually quite um, uh, quite substantial sums for things like um, wash down areas for sprayers where pesticides can be treated really safely, um, biofilters to treat those, concreting yards, again, things that will help reduce the risk of pollution incidents occurring. A few key dates to be aware of. Um, so for higher tier, we're in the midst of it at the moment. Uh, the application's deadline is the end of April. For mid tier, this at the moment people have a bit longer. Um, the application deadline is the end of July. But for some of those options, like the wet grassland, for example, where you have to um, uh, uh, apply for uh, endorsements or approval, or sometimes that happens has to happen by deadlines before then. Um, the wildlife offers is all usually done online. Again, you just get it done by the end of July. And the capital grants only. Um, the deadline is the end of this April. So again, that's not too far away. And then for most of those schemes, um, if they're successful, they would start next January. Apart from capital grants, they, they can start a bit sooner. And I said, there's a separate scheme that's much more tailored to woodland. 
uh, which we're not going to look at because we're talking about farming birds particularly today. But just be aware there are lots of there are schemes out there for both tree planting and and uh, managing existing woodlands. Um, so yes, um, the people if, who who are su successful would get um, an agreement offer hopefully by Christmas. Um, their agreement would then go live on the first of January. Uh, and for new options like those winter bird food mixes and those nectar flower mixes, they've got 12 months to get them um, in the ground and growing. Um, so that's that's helpful. And for capital items, they have two years to complete any of those fences or, or hedgerow work that they want to do. However, they are pretty much committed for those five years. There's very little flexibility in being able to make changes once that agreement's running. Um, and then they would claim for their payments every year and they would take a few months to come through. Um, so I'm going to close with some top tips. Um, advice on these things is really important to get them to work well, both at the very beginning um, and really throughout the application process and through delivery. It's it's um, it's absolutely the, the making of these schemes and getting them to work well for wildlife, which is ultimately what we and what the farmers want. Um, it's a good idea if someone has an agronomist, so someone who provides them with advice on their crops. Involve that person. You need everybody in the farming team on board with this and to, to be able to input into it. Um, it does kind of force people to take an honest look at um, the yielding of their of their fields and of different bits of the field. Um, this isn't a farm uh, uh, talk about pub yields, so what, what they tell each other in the pub when we had those things um, uh, and being a bit competitive, but actually this is about being being real and sometimes it may pay them better to take a small area of farm out of arable cropping and put it into one of these wildlife habitats. And just to reiterate, the, the key thing is to identify what people have already and then use the right mix of options to, to manage those really well, to improve them and to get from them. Um, and I think it's also important that farmers kind of get the opportunity and are allowed to enjoy the fruits of their labour. Um, they're allowed to enjoy the butterflies and insects in the summer and they're allowed to enjoy their winter in farm and birds. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the bit that they're all doing it for really. Um, so I hope that was a useful rundown of um, some of the stewardship options that I think are, are most appropriate to this particular landscape and can really help wildlife farm and birds. There is a lot of technical detail in there. Um, uh, and I'm aware that not all of that will be really relevant to people in their day-to-day -day lives. But I hope it's given you a bit of a flavour at least of what's what's involved. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now and um, uh, I'll see where we want to go next. Thank you, Kirsty. That was, uh, well, I found it really interesting. It was a really good overview and gave us a lot of options and a lot of um, chances of discussion and probably food for thought for some of the uh, participants um, in the uh, workshop. I don't know if anybody else has got any sort of basic comments. I've got a couple of, I've, got, I've had a couple of questions, but I think some of those are more to do with the hedge row things and I, I know Mike um, you said you've probably got a couple of questions. There was one important question that came through Christine um, okay, sorry. Jim asking if there's a minimum size for a land holding. Oh yeah, yeah yeah sorry yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question without looking it up um, I think there probably is but I think it's quite small. Um, certainly uh, I think it's basically the minimum size for their direct payments called basic payment scheme which I think is something like five hectares. Um, uh, there's no minimum area for a stewardship agreement, so it's yeah, it's it's quite small. But I might be able to follow that up. If... Is that okay for you, Jim? Jim, do you now so ask to, um, another Jim, question Jim about huh. are the schemes for farmers only, or can local councils and others apply to participate in stewardship? Well, the answer to that question because I work for a local council and we we um we are looking at um, stewardship so yeah councils are also eligible to apply um so um, did you want to add anything to that? That was it's a good question um so there are some bodies that are ineligible for them um certainly crown funded bodies um and um, people like environment agency um. So, as you say, I think councils are exempt. I think they are eligible to apply, but um, if, obviously if you're in a slightly different situation, um, then it is worth checking the manual quite carefully. What about county county wildlife trusts? They, they've got a lot of reserves. Do they participate? Yes, they do, Jim. Um, you'll find that a, um, a lot of wildlife trust reserves are under uh, one of these schemes, usually the, the higher levels. Um, so, yes, they make use of them quite well. Thank you. 
we uh, another question or point of there's another question on the chat uh, from jim about whether it's best to remove elder when maintaining head mm -hmm. I guess it's a kind of I can only give you my my opinion here um, for what it's worth. So, I, I mean, I like elder. Um, I like making elderflower cordial. I think the berries are a great source of food for for buds. Um, I prefer elder in woodland glades and on the edges of woodlands. I think if it's the dominant species in a big section of hedgerow, it can the hedgerow to becoming gappy because it expands. It doesn't tolerate other species terribly well, and you end up with a gap. So I would rather have elder in shrubby in scrubbies and um, in sort of woodland parts rather than a hedge but um but I, i'm not going to object to it as long as as long as i can deal with it i know from um from some of our local um hedge layers there are some that are quite appreciative of elder but most of them don't like it in their hedge and they will chop it you know they will chop it down and make sure that it doesn't um appear when they're doing the hedge laying because it is one of the in our local area and i'm presuming in lots of others it is such a weed species it pops up everywhere and like you know kirsty was saying it can overrun the hedge and you know, cause a few more problems than um, than not but it is a very valuable it's very valuable for lots of lots of things and and in some areas um you know it can grow to a considerable age i'm thinking of you know more of some of our shadow shadow woods type of um type of areas where you know you you used to have them planted uh, outside farms or near farms for you know for the um uh, protection of the uh, of the livestock well i'm not going to all all of that so that's a completely different story but you know that that is one of the things that you know some of the hedgers say no you know we'll take all of the all of the elder out and others will say well we'll just leave you know a bit but we're going to monitor it so uh, yes please mike the scheme you were describing it helps me sort of read the landscape that I've been walking, riding, running through for, for the last 20 odd years. So thank you. Um, we, we're a small village based um, uh, conservation group and we're keen to work in partnership with our local landowners and farmers. And so we're, we're sort of excited by the prospect of the agriculture bill and the idea of public good. And so we, I suppose what we're asking ourselves is how can, what, what can we uh, do to help local farm, our local farmers, because most of them are quite small, small scale farmers, um, make the most of, of the new acts, I suppose. It's, um, so we do, we do things like um, hedge planting, tree pl uh, planting, uh, wildflowers, but all on a very small scale. And we realise that really to make the sort of dramatic improvement that we want to make to the local landscape, it, it, it's going to be essentially uh, on farmland. And so... We, we want to know what can we do um, at a local level um, to um, to determine what public good looks like in, in, in our village, for example, or, or could look like in, in 20, 30 years time. Uh, and what can we do in practical terms to, to help local farmers? Well, I certainly had a bit of a think about, well, early on I was having a think about the sort of practical elements. Um, you know, what could a community group by itself kind of offer farmers that would actually help them? and encourage them in a really in a really gentle way to kind of look at some of these things and, and take them on board um i'm sure that most farmers are looking at these in fact i've I'm got my busiest year ever because people are looking at all this agricultural change in the way the systems are set up and then i going oh goodness my direct payments are going down right now what am i going to do about that how am i going to survive from a farm or a tenant farm um so i guarantee you people are looking at this um there's a few things um i said some of those options you have to show that you're eligible for so um, for example most wet grassland ones um, if sites are not already mapped on magic as being eligible for those wet grassland options then actually making sure your bird records of either of breeding ways or of wintering ways and wildfowl making sure those are somewhere sensible that the farms can access them like be at your record center or even just go you know farmers love having positive feedback about their land they get so much negative feedback anything positive you say to them um, will go down really well 
um, uh, another of those options I didn't touch on, but uh, payments for species rich grassland, so kind of flower rich natural grasslands. Um, again, I know lots of farms that I go to and I find these banks or these bits that um, are full of wildflowers and they're not, they're not recorded as such. And without being recorded as such, the farmer can't access the payments to encourage them to manage them appropriately. So again, botanical records or um, uh, offering to go out and you know, uh, offer these services would be great. Um, and the other one that is eligible is, is where you've got traditional orchards or relics of traditional orchards. Again, on Magic, you'll find quite a lot of them on that, but not all of them. So again, if you've got places usually on the outskirts of holdings and things like that that have these relics, orchard trees, it's a good idea to talk to Natural England to try and get them mapped as such so that they can get the payments to restore them if they want to in the future. Um, so some stuff about eligibility. Um, there's certainly some stuff around practical work around, around hedgerows. Um, and Jim, I think your video, you mentioned um, the spirals on a 15 year old hedge that hadn't been removed yet. I mean, that, that's classic. Mm. I see that so much where people haven't got around to removing spirals. So pairs of hands for hedgerow work can, can often be really appreciated. Um, and equally, the supplementary feeding in winter that I mentioned. Um, I do know some far farms who have um, some really dedicated bird enthusiasts who will actually help with that weekly winter feeding. They'll go out they'll, um, and put the food down. They do have to keep the records, though. So as a requirement of that option, they have to keep a feeding diary of how much food they're putting down and when and where, which you'd have to do. Again, that's another thing that could, can be really helpful and very rewarding. Um, just I, the only thing I counter that with is um, these schemes are quite complex. I think you probably got a sight of, um, and there is a lot of small small print in those prescription details. So it's a good idea to encourage people to look at things, but they do do be cautious if you're getting into the area of giving advice on conservation, um, unless you have liability insurance. Um, uh, but I think anything you do that makes it clear to your local land managers that you know you you appreciate living in a wildlife rich area, and you know you you help you'd be willing to help where you could. Um, I'm sure it's only going to go down really well. Thank you. Yes, Jim. Well, picking up on what Kirsty said, I think uh, we were talking before the meeting. If you're a botanist or a bird watcher or a bat worker or have a, a, a an interest in those subjects, asking the farmers and landowners whether you can survey their land and telling them what you find that helps them understand what options they should be looking at. Um, and picking up what Kirsty said also, I mean, if you find good habitat, it, you can get it added via your local biological records office as a local wildlife site. And that then could be part of the farm environmental record. So it's, there's a lot of cross fertilization that can be done. Yes, I think people use um, wildlife recording apps now, like iRecord and things like that. It can be a really simple way of, of getting your records to the right places, as long as obviously it's being either collected from somewhere you've got permission to access. Um, uh, but those records are then checked, aren't they, by, by experts, and they end up in. If you say your biological records centre or the NBN, they end up where it can help make a difference and make sure that the money goes to the right places. And that, that was one of the things that we were hoping to start to do a lot more recording through the Wilder Ancombe project. And, you know, because of other circumstances, it hasn't quite happened in the way that we were hoping. But, but hopefully this year we'll be able to do more and support in a local group to do some of that there and I think also on the just to sort of flag up on the maps and the magic maps but you know we've used those quite a lot and it's uh, um, there are open source mapping packages where you can then manipulate all of that because you can download a lot of it and then you can manipulate it yourself and you know another uh, maybe if the farmers haven't already done is to actually do some of that mapping and build up that wider picture Oh, you know, I almost guarantee you they haven't. And the, you know, from especially from the historical, because that was another thing that oh, um, Louis and I were talking to my, Mike about was about the historical and the heritage part of it and how quickly uh, landscapes might change or how 
they don't particularly change but you know you know and people's recollections and memories of what used to be then you know like the, the uh, trees falling over or things growing up and you know the different things there so there's probably again there's something to help to gather some of that information for people you know for then it to be then to be made available for people to use for their farm records for example um, I didn't mention it but there is a um part of the application process for most of these stewardship schemes includes an automatic check with Historic England and also the County Archaeological Office. So they will generate a, a pack of everything they know about that particular farm area in terms of either scheduled ancient monuments but also anything on the, um, the, the shine yeah. inventory um, and recommendations of what to and do. That, that. that with the law. Um, so, so it captures some of those databases, but not everything that you I mean, with the at all. Lot that is also about what the quality of, not the quality, but the amount of records and the type that is actually in the records itself. You know, we, we know that with a lot of projects that, you know, we know things on the ground, but when you're in the official record, you know, people sort of assume that they're already there. But when you actually go and have a look, they're not necessarily there. But if that's the only thing that the you know the um, for whoever or whoever are looking at or pointing to, then you know there may be gaps, and it's useful for sort of for local groups and local projects to make sure that we're filling those gaps. Yeah. So the wider. There's another question here on the chat. Um, how best can you utilise smaller areas of retained and created habitats? Um, is there any guidance on ideal size of habitats to aim for um, to be the most use? Um, I'm not entirely sure. We might do we need a slight? It might vary depending on your target species or your habitat. We might we might need a few more specifics there. Uh, do you have any thoughts, Kirsty or, or, or Jim? Or is it? Yeah, I think it. I think it does. It um, there's, there's two aspects, aren't there? There's um, what are you talking? Um, because as a rule of thumb, small creatures need small areas and large creatures need large areas. So it depends on the mobility of your of your organism, but also things like um, the practicality of managing that feature. So for some of these options that I was talking about earlier, it makes sense actually to go quite large um, uh, because it makes it easier to manage them well. And also it makes it a job worth doing. Um, I think one, one fear or, and I have seen is where you have quite small areas of um, habitats, natural habitat left, then even if they need a bit of managing, like, like cutting at the end of the year, it's a wildflower there. If it's a really small area, it's very easy to get forgotten about and it never, they never get round to it. So there is something to be said for having bigger chunks. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know, uh, Chloe, I think you asked the question, and I wondered if there was anything you wanted to expand on that kind of, um, that, um, uh, yeah, if you want to expand your question slightly. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought it might. <laughs> I was trying to it in a way that was uh, understandable. Um, I, I'm actually a consultant ecologist, so I see a lot of development that goes on, um, including on a lot of arable sites. And the thing that frustrates me is a lot of developers obviously want to develop as much of that site as possible. And they'll only be leaving like a buffer along here and they might plant a few hedgerows or whatever. So what I, what I was sort of getting at is in a situation like that, how best can you... Um, mitigate for the loss of such a large or potentially a large site when you might have things like skylarks and yellow hammers and things where you know, you're going to get skylarks nesting in a little bit of habitat in the corner um, and it's a struggle that I have with making recommendations in terms of um, what if you've really got a small bit of area what, what best can you put in there lots of mosaics of habitats or aim for one large extent of habitat or that's kind of what I was getting at, really. Well, that's that's really helpful, and I I and I, I know exactly the sort of situation you're describing. It's it's very common, and I see it a lot. You know, there's tiny little strips left in plans because that's there for foraging bats or something. And you just think, oh, yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, so yeah, realistically, the sorts of species you just mentioned, things like skylark and yellowhammer, you, you're never going to be able to mitigate developments at scale for them on on the development site. Really, not going to hang around once you start building houses and tall structures. Um, I think you can include features for obviously smaller, um, for less mobile wildlife. Um, and certainly the corridor structure can work really well incorporating or, or retaining uh, features that act as corridors, like old hedgerows, for example, can work quite well, even through even through residential developments, for example. Um, 
but I, I, I still think actually you would need to bear in mind the practicalities of management as well, because very often in these developed sites, um, you don't have um, a very detailed management plan or, or contractors and people in charge of management who are, who are going to be able to do quite detailed work. So it might, you might be looking at chunks um, that can actually be managed favourably rather than lots of very detailed and mosaic structures that are very easy to put on, on a mower to run over. Um, so it might, so it might be a, I think you probably are going to have to be balancing both of those different aspects when you're trying to make recommendations, but I appreciate it is quite challenging. Yeah, it is. Thanks for that, Kirsty. Um, we've just got one final question, which will be interesting, um, about extensive use of chemicals on farmland and how concerned are we or should we be? Uh, Jim? Kirsty? Um, personal viewpoint, I, I think there's encouraging signs a lot of farmers are going for lower inputs. They're looking at the entire cost of the uh, crop production and by lowering inputs um, um, and less spraying, they can still get a similar um, return by, by doing less and accepting, you know, a lower, by less than inputs, they get a lower, lower productivity, but equally um, they're spending less on um, inputs to the to the resultant crop if that makes sense uh, and some of the options that Kirsty was picking up like the two-year legume option that's uh, probably a more effective way of getting rid of um, black grass which is a problem with short rotation or sowing um, than you know leaving the field uh, fallow and, and spraying it off once or twice with um, you know things like Roundup. There's no doubt that um, certainly the indirect effects of chemicals, and we're talking mostly here about um, what are now termed plant protection products, um, so herbicides that take out um, uh, uh, weeds um, and pesticides that take out um, potentially problematic insects. Um, that, that you know the indirect effects of those on on wildlife has have been quite profound um, because this is ultimately a food production system and there is inevitably a competition over food between us and everything else um, so that's that's why they exist but as Jim said I do see I see more variation now in how farmers are, are, are viewing this and, and using them there are still quite a lot who um, you know they know what has worked for them in the past and they will be quite difficult to persuade to do otherwise but there are an increasing number still quite small but an increasing number who um, uh, as Jim said, we'll, we'll, um, we'll take thresholds, so they'll only apply things when they can demonstrate and have a measure that actually it's, it's needed and required. There are some farmers who are going completely insecticide free for a few years and have are reporting massive improvements in beneficial insects and associated sort of um, wintering bird numbers out in the field. So I think there are there are opportunities, there is room for improvement. Um, and the to pick up on another sort of recent topic in terms of um, neonics, so these are um, uh, insecticides that are that have been used usually as seed treatments. Um, but the concern was that um, uh, actually, although the use of that product was quite targeted somewhere that wildlife wasn't going to find it very easily, it's going to be buried under the ground. There was evidence that actually that product was uh, ending up in places where wildlife are very much going to be able to find it. So it's actually being translocated through the soil and ending up in the wildflowers in the margin next door. Now to me and to most farmers who would, you know, had gone through the trouble of making that wildflower margin, that's horrendous. Um, and at the moment we do have a, we are in the middle of a ban on the onyx of this country um, whilst that is reviewed. But it's those sorts of situations um, that uh, I think most people both both conservationists and farmers, they want to be doing the right thing, um, but they want it to be evidence-based. Thanks, thanks for that, Kirsty. That was a good, uh, a good explanation because that was that was one of the things that was in my mind that you know if, if you're putting all this work and getting the new schemes for you know flower-rich margins and all the rest of it, then there's a bit of a contradiction if you've also got you know heavily um, managed crops very close by that I think that that explains it 
you know, sort of uh, really well while they what some of the issues are. So thanks for that. It was just to say that um, I also sense when I was working at the RSBB and talking to farmers I meet through my Alvox work, there's a lot more interest in soil health. And if you cut back on pesticides, the soil tends to be better. There's more invertebrates in the soil as well as the plant communities. And that benefits birds as well and makes the soil more productive. Which is, which is part of, um, that sort of leads in, thank you, Jim, that leads in very nicely to our um, uh, upcoming September conference, uh, which, it, which it are around the, that, um, the, uh, is around that theme. It'll be, it'll, it's a three day uh, examination of lots of different elements of that. Oh. So we'll definitely share all of that um, with it. And so if there's nothing further, anybody, I'd like to thank you all very much uh, for uh, participating and a special thanks to uh, Kirsty and to uh, Jim for hard work. Um, and the uh, really interesting uh, presentations and also thanks to to lewis um, as well lewis have you got any final nothing, uh, nothing more thing you'd like to great. you'd like to say i've forgotten anything team <laughs> <laughs> hopefully hopefully not but if if i have then uh, we'll um, we'll be back in touch so uh i might say thank you and um enjoy the rest of your your friday afternoon and i think we did it just in time because i can hear the the demolition people are packing away <laughs> okay thank you bye